Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Welcome those that are joining us online. We are so excited that we are here today. We are so excited you are here today as we begin our journey through the Gospel of Luke. And there's no better time than the present in this particular time of year since Luke begins with many of the stories that involve the birth of Jesus. But our journey, as Joe told us, is not going to end uh, here at the end uh, of the month like a normal Christmas series would end. Our journey is going to take us all the way into June of next year as we go through this journey of the book of Luke. And probably one of the things I'm most excited about is our Gospel of Luke uh, scripture journals. If you've not picked one of these up, there are a few left of the first order here in the Welcome Center. Please get one of those. Uh, and make it yours. Write in it and, and study through it because this is what I'm going to be teaching of. You're really going to get most out of this if you have one of these scripture texts. The same one that I'm going to be using as we preach through and teach the book uh, of Luke. And mine kind of looks like this. Already got some stuff in there and hopefully you will get yours filled up as well. And so go ahead and be opening up in your Bibles to Luke the first chapter as we get going <laughs> there we go um, uh, go ahead and open there uh, as many of you already know or some of you might know Luke is a doctor and one of the reasons why we know that Luke is a doctor is because Paul mentions that Luke is a doctor in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 14 and so as we're reading this gospel, we're reading something that was written by a physician of the day. That helps us understand. But his greatest contribution probably wasn't as a physician. His greatest contribution was most likely being the author who pointed to the great physician and really gave us the best kind of medicine that we all need. One of the most unique things about this gospel is that it is actually addressed to one single person, one particular person. You learned this as you began your reading in chapter 1 this week, that we'll find this man's name is Theophilus. You find out in Luke chapter 1 and verse 4, in fact, let's just go ahead and start with the first few verses, because he sets this up for us. In Luke chapter 1, Beginning in verse 1, we read, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word and have delivered them to us. That's a long run-on sentence. I think maybe he was related to Paul. But what's he saying here? He's saying that a lot of people have compiled a lot of stories about Jesus and about the life of Jesus. One of those people we talked about recently was Mark. Luke's uh, uh, gospel and Mark's gospel. Mark's gospel probably was already floating around at this time because Luke's gospel was written later. And he's saying a lot of people have compiled the stories about Jesus. Let's keep reading in verse 3. Where he says, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. How'd you like to have that name? <laughs> that you may have certainty concerning the things that have been taught. And it's, it's here you see who this gospel was originally written for. The guy's name is Theophilus. And that name, Theophilus, means friend of God or, or even lover of God. And by the way, he is most excellent for some reason. We don't know why, but he is. Theophilus is someone who, well, here's what you need to know. He's already a follower of Jesus. Because Luke tells us in the scripture, I'm writing to you about things that you've already been taught. And that tells you something right here, that while the gospel can be for someone who has never known Jesus, who's never met Jesus, who's never been introduced to Jesus, you know, 
People ask me all the time, where should I start reading the Bible if I've never read the Bible before? And I said, that's easy. I always tell them, you start in the Gospels because that's what you do. You, you, you start with Jesus. You need to meet Jesus first. He's most important. And while absolutely you can be in the Gospel and meet Luke for the very first time, I think it's helpful for us to remember that this Gospel was originally written to someone who is already following Jesus. And the reason that's important is that because the gospel is for people who know Jesus, who think they know Jesus, or for people that don't know Jesus at all. It's the gospel for everybody. And one of the most beautiful things about the gospels of Jesus Christ is that they are shallow enough for a baby to wade in, but yet they're deep enough for an elephant to drown. In. And so wherever you might be, it's time to go deeper with Jesus. Can I get an amen? amen? Let's dive right in. We're going to go back to our text. Verse 5, we pick up Luke 1. Verse 5, in the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commands and statutes of the Lord. In other words, this is a godly couple. He is a priest. That They're both the real deal. They've gone through this. They are walking with God. But there's a problem. There's a problem in that the Luke sets out in that word, but... When you read the Bible and you see that word but in a story, you need to pay attention because it's about to tell you about the underbelly of the story and about the, the, the basics of the situation. But let's get back to verse 7 here. We read Luke 1, 7, but they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. So it tells us they didn't have children for two reasons. One, Elizabeth had been barren her whole life. And the second being, they're both now, at this point, well advanced in years. And this would have been a very painful ache on a daily basis for them. Because in ancient Jewish culture, a woman's significance was validated by having children. Women found their sense of worth and esteem in, in being able to bring forth children. And by the way, one of the most incredible things that Jesus will do later on in the Gospel of Luke is show how a woman's worth has nothing to do whether or not she can bear children. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Back to chapter 1. All you need to know now is that you have a priest, you have his wife, and they are portrayed as people with integrity. They have been faithfully serving God all these years, and yet they have no children. And you can bet everybody knew them and would occasionally scratch their head and wonder why. Was it something she had done? Was it something he had done? Are they under the judgment of God? The question begs, what's wrong with them? And that's what people would have asked. And something like this would have been subject to much talk and much conjecture. Have you ever known a person who's been characterized as one that, that walks with God? And doing so many things right in their life, and yet there is something that is so wonderful that they have always longed for, that they have always wanted, but it still has not happened to them. But it's happening to everybody else. This is that couple, and they're living every single day with that age. We go back to scripture in verse eight we pick up. Now while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, 
He was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And a whole multitude of people were praying outside at that hour of incense. So here's what you need to know. There were about, at that time, about 18,000 priests that were serving in Jerusalem at this time. And they would rotate their duties, the priestly duties, in and around the temple. Some of the most honorable and treasured duties you got chosen for by lot. Now, you may not know that term, but the best way to describe it is they drew straws. Zechariah had probably done duties in the temple before, but, but this thing is treasured. He probably never done this before. Burning incense in the temple, and he has been chosen by lot. That would mean in their minds that God had an actual hand in the choosing. This is a lottery of sorts, and he has been chosen. And what makes this moment so special is you have these masses of people that are outside the temple and they are praying at the moment that he is burning incense at that particular part of the temple. Well, you ask, what are they praying for? The prayer of the Israelites. They were praying for the redemption of Israel. You say, Lee, what is that? They're praying that God would forgive Israel of Israel's past sins, would deliver Israel from its bondage. Right now, it happens to be bondage under the Roman Empire. And he's in there praying. And he's burning this incense. Luke 1 and verse 11 says, And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord, standing on the right side of the altar of incense, and Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. Now, you guys know I'm a Hallmark fan, right? This time of year, we've got those movies that are out. There's lots of them. Lots and lots of them. And in a lot of these movies, there's angels. But this is not a Hallmark angel movie that we're talking about here, people. You see Hallmark movies these days have angels that are warm and fuzzy and, and sweet and warm and cuddly and precious moment like you hang on the mantle. They're just so fragile and delicate. This is not that type of angel. In Hallmark, nobody's afraid of the angel. In the Bible, when the angel shows up, everybody starts freaking out. An angel has usually been there, and he's got to calm down the people that they're talking about and the people that they're talking to. Zechariah is troubled, the scripture tells us. He's doing a duty in the temple, and a supernatural being has just shown up. Let's get back to our story. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid. We know this because we've talked about it before. What is the most command in the Bible? Do not be afraid. Zechariah, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. <coughs> the angel says, your prayer has been heard. What prayer? Well, he's in there praying, right? He's giving incense. I think the Lord is doing this double thing with him and a double meaning. In one sense, he just prayed a prayer that, that Israel would be redeemed of its sin and be forgiven. And he has no idea that the thing that he's praying for is actually starting to happen. But there's a second prayer I think he's referring to. And I think it's a prayer that Zechariah had not prayed in years. Advanced in years, would have been, how long ago had he stopped praying for a child? His wife had been barren, and they were both, as it said, well advanced in years. And I bet he had not prayed for this, this prayer for a child in many years. He probably thought, as we talked about earlier, he probably thought the answer was no. And maybe even he had given up on this prayer. You know, sometimes 
we give up on our prayers long before God does. And that's not to say that everything you pray for you're going to get, but it is to say that sometimes you and I assume a no when maybe God is just saying, not yet. But he's told, your prayers have been heard. The name John that is used here, the name John means gift of God. And that's what it's going to have to be. Because she's barren. They're both old. The angel continues in the text there in verse 14. It says, you will have joy and gladness. And many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink strong drink, a wine or strong drink. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's words. Those are powerful words. This is so powerful, even from his mother's womb. Because if you consider the rest of Scripture, if you take it all to, to account, God's Spirit only fills things that are holy. And this is just a little reminder that a child within the womb is sacred ground. And this child will grow to declare the coming of another who would eventually make it possible for all of us to become holy so that we can be filled with that same spirit. We continue reading verse 16. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just and to make ready the Lord a prepared people. In other words, the angel is saying, your boy is going to be something else. He's going to be the real deal. Some of you are wondering right now, maybe, oh, who's Elijah? Well, Elijah was a prophet, definitely, that Zechariah and all of the Jews would have known. Probably one of the most powerful prophets in the Old Testament. And there's tons of stories that you can read about it. If you're not familiar with this, it would be like an angel coming to you. If you're an avid football fan and saying, you're going to have a boy, and he's going to grow up in the spirit and the power of Peyton Manning and Brett Favre. This is going to be a powerful situation. And this is so much for, for Zechariah to absorb. I mean, he's going to have a miracle baby. And this baby is going to have amazing impact on the world that is around him. And the world forever to come. Luke 1 and verse 18, and Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I'm an old man and my wife is well advanced in years. You know what we learned about Zechariah here? This guy's been married a long time. He's learned how to do it. He says, I'm an old man. She's advanced in years. Yeah, a smart man. The first words, though, that we see out of Zechariah's mouth of the story is a measure of disbelief. He wants a sign. If an angel isn't enough... Really, people? You remember Michael W. Smith had a song out a few years ago talked about entertaining angels unaware? This time that we're talking about here with Zechariah, I think Zechariah is actually irritating angels unaware. We're going to find that out here. Luke 1 and verse 19. And the angel answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. In other words, dude, isn't it enough of a sign that there's an angel here? You want another sign? Look at this. Behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place. Because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. Be careful what you ask for. You want a sign? All right, you're going to be, you're going to be uh, unable to speak for the next nine months. Why is Gabriel so hard on Zechariah? I don't know. Part of me, and I have a couple of hunches on this, maybe because he was a priest, that more was expected of Zechariah. He would have known the, the Old Testament. He would have known that there are stories 
in the Old Testament of God making men and women that are well advanced in years, old people, pregnant. He knew the story of Abraham and Sarah. Zechariah knew these stories, but here's the deal. And this is as true for us. It is one thing to read it in black and white. It's quite another thing to really believe it and to live it out in your life in living color. There's a lot of people that they live their whole life in church. They, they read it in black and white, but they don't actually believe it in living color, walking and talking among us. Maybe it's simply, if you're a peace priest, you're not going to be able to speak in regards to things of faith until you see what God is going to do, because you're better off just being silent. Or maybe this was for other people, not for Zechariah at all. You see, nobody else is going to see the angel but Zechariah. But they are going to see him emerge, silent, and they're going to go, ooh, yeah, Zechariah saw an angel. But for nine months, he doesn't talk. And then they have John. And all of a sudden, he's talking again. Maybe that would cause most people to go, you know what? Maybe something did happen in the temple. Maybe there is something up with this boy. Maybe we better pay attention to what this boy has to say. Because this encounter with an angel took a little while. There's a mass of people, as we read, that are assembled outside. They're waiting for Zechariah to come out. And because Zechariah has gotten to do something that he doesn't normally get to do, he would have had his people there. This is a once-in-a-life situation. He's got his family and his friends. We've done that, right? It's your big day. You're going to preach your first sermon. Are you going to tell nobody about it? No, you're going to tell mom and dad and grandparents and aunts and uncles, and you're going to fill the place because you want them to be part of it. And Zechariah has done the same thing. They're there watching and waiting, and they all show up. And they're waiting for him. And he's taking forever. Luke chapter 1, verse 21, we continue our reading. It says, And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and reminding, and he remained mute. And when his time of service had ended, he went to his home. It's very confusing. Did he, did he know sign language? How did he express what was happening? Can, can you imagine the confusion out there when he had come out? He goes in, he's speaking, he comes out, he can't speak. He's frantically making motions. He's like Lee Scott preaching. <laughs> what's, what's going on? And isn't it interesting that Zechariah, mute and all, it says he still finishes with his time of service. Did you notice that? He had a supernatural encounter with an angel. But even that doesn't let him off the hook. He still stays and he serves, but he can't talk. But he serves his time and he finishes his duty in the temple. Verse 24 after these days, that what days? The days we just talked about. His wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. She's like, wow. And Elizabeth now, she's got something to look forward to. You know, I, I learned this when I talked to our brothers and sisters that are, as the scriptures say, well advanced in years. Some of my older brothers and sisters, they talk about how challenging it is, the longer you live, to find things to look forward to. When you're young, you have everything to look forward to. But when you're advanced in years, you've had so many experiences, what is there left to look forward to? It says, Elizabeth, can you imagine? She's been barren her whole life. She's well along in years. She has a child 
to look forward to, to relish a life inside her, with her husband by her side, not saying a word. It's a wife's dream come true. <laughs> Now, now, some women would like this, right? Yeah. But let's jump forward. Let's jump forward in several months. You're going to have to turn a couple of pages because we're going to go over to verse 57. We're going to go all the way down to Luke 51, 57 because we want to stay with this story. We're going to get to the other story next week. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. And her relatives and neighbors heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. Can you imagine this? If you have ever had something monumentous happen in your life, or monumentous that happened for a dear friend for years and decades, you're going to rejoice with them, right? But it's on the eighth day, the scripture says, they came to circumcise the child they would have called him Zechariah after his father, but his mother answered, No, he shall be called John. And they said to her, None of your relatives are called by this name. And they made signs to his father. It was like Preacher Lee, okay? They made signs to his father. This is so odd. The Bible, the story never says that he's deaf. He's the one making signs. But after nine months, maybe they have mercy on him and they're talking to him in his language. And they decide, hey, we're going to talk to him the way that he talks to us. I just think that's kind of interesting. We'll play on his field. We'll start making signs. It goes on to say they were inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet. And he wrote, his name is John. And they all wondered. And immediately his mouth was opened, his tongue was loosed, and he spoke, blessing God. This is amazing. The first time you see Zechariah speak in our narrative, he's speaking words of anything but faith. But now this is, is done. The second time he speaks after being silent for nine months, and the first words of his mouth, are they cursing God? You made me deaf. You made me silent for nine months. No, they're not. They're blessing God. Verse 65, we continue, and the fear came upon all of the neighbors. And all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. Can you imagine? It was at the bunco groups, and it was down at the factory, and it was in the synagogue, in the street courts. Everybody was talking about it. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts saying, What then will this child be? Everyone had their attention on this child. Because it says, For the hand of the Lord was with him. And then the one who had been silent for nine months he suddenly bursts out into song in the scripture. In verses 69, or 68 through 79, I'm not going to read that whole thing, but I want you to. I want you to look at that, and I want you to see something. This is a picture of my journal, and that's on page 16. The first half, verses 68 through 79 there, when Zechariah bursts out in, in song, the first half of it, Verses 68 through 75 is all about Jesus. And that's why I want you to sh show you my journal here. This is the first half, 68 to 75. It's all about Jesus. It's not until the second half that goes from 76 to 79. That's all about Zacharias, son John. And here's what I wanted you to know from this. The father of John actually starts with Jesus, because he's the horn of salvation. Zechariah already knew that Jesus was the point, even more than his own son. And Zechariah knows that his gift is really designed to pave the way for the ultimate gift that is Jesus. Amen? Amen. 
But there's a couple of things that I want us to notice there. In verse 74, we see the result of Jesus coming would be, and please, please, please get a hold of this, that we might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. That's the reason. That's one of the reasons why Jesus comes. He has come to take the fear out of the equation when it comes to our relationship with God. Isn't that good? Because I'll tell you this, a lot of people have fear when it comes to their relationship with God. A lot of people do. That if they exist and they realize he exists and they have fear about the very ground that they stand on with him. But one of the reasons that Jesus comes is to make it possible for us to relate to God without fear. How? Because through Jesus, we would become holy and righteous before God again. That leads me to the second thing that I wanted to notice in the prayer. And that's in verse 77. When Zechariah is prophesying about John, he says that John will go before the people. Why? To give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. This is one of the definitions, folks, of salvation. I, I think in Scripture tells us it's the forgiveness of our sins. That's one of the things that means to be saved. I know a lot of people say, oh, I got saved so I can go to heaven, right? Yeah, but it means more than that. One of the things that it means, salvation means that I am, can be knowing that I am forgiven. That is salvation. That's a fundamental element of salvation when I know personally and individually that I'm forgiven. And he said John is going to go before the people and he's going to set the stage for people to know salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. And what difference does that make when your sins are forgiven, go to verse 79. The very last verse of the song tells us to guide our feet in the way of peace. Because, brothers and sisters, when one experiences forgiveness, they can begin to walk in peace. But until you have experienced forgiveness, there is no peace. There is no peace without experiencing forgiveness. There's a lot of restless people. There's a lot of powerful people in the world that are desperately searching for peace that is only going to be found through the experience of having been forgiven of their sins. Chapter 1 concludes with the description of how the boy John would grow up. It says in verse 24, and the child grew and became strong in spirit and was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance in Israel. This is really powerful to me because in our story, we began in the temple with a sweet, faithful priest who is struggling to believe. But we have the story ends with the son of the priest that is so far outside the temple system. He's in the wilderness. He is growing in God in a way that is so different than his father did. And here you have God using someone from the institution and someone from way outside the institution just to turn this whole thing loose. Woo! Mm. I can preach now. But I don't have time. We've got to get going. But I do want to leave you with a few things. Are you ready? I'm going to leave you with three things that the story of Zechariah reminds us of. I want you to write these down. The first point that we see is this. When God's at work, silence and waiting are usually involved. You know, we're, we're not known for waiting well in our culture. We're really not. Every time I think about how we hate to wait, I, I think about the Russian comedian Smirnov. That's actually his name. He wasn't named after the vodka. But he immigrated to the United States. And he would say that one of the things he loved most about America is when he first came, he would go to the grocery stores. He'd walk down our aisles. And he would be stunned by everything that could be cooked in an instant. 
he walked down the aisle and he noticed things like powdered milk. He'd look at the sign, he says, just add water and you have milk. He'd go to the next aisle and says, and you'd have powdered orange juice. Add water and you have orange juice. A couple of aisles later, he sees baby powder. And he thinks to himself, what a country. But no, babies aren't made that fast. Are they? Zachariah and Elizabeth had to wait a long, long time because God was still at work. Some of you may be familiar with the term Advent. You hear it a lot this time of year, and it has a couple of different meanings, but the one that I want to talk to you about today is really, it means waiting. It captures the essence of the drama of the coming of the Lord. Why is silence and waiting so involved when God's at work? I think it boils down to this, because God is for me. But he's not all about me. He's about other people too. You see, the reason why people are giving their attention to John and, and what he has to say is because of the way he came into the world. He is a miracle. That miracle birth set the stage for another miracle. This was a man and a woman made to wait decades before they could have a child. But this also goes for Zechariah. Not being able to talk for nine months and then certain, suddenly he's able to talk. And in that moment, he names John, John, him not talking for nine months, them waiting for decades to have a child. This all setting the stage so that people could see the actual hand of God involved in the story. And pay attention and watch. And sometimes you have to wait because God is for you. But he's not all about you. And he's setting a stage for an environment to be established where at a certain moment people will inaugurably see the hand of God that is involved in your life. And they're going to know, that ain't you. They're going to look at that situation and they're going to say, that just ain't him. That isn't her. And so sometimes silence and waiting are involved. God is for me. He's not all about me. He's about others as well. He's about reaching others. So what do you have to do while you're waiting? I'll tell you what you have to do while you're waiting. You keep showing up like Zachariah. You keep doing your work. And you keep doing what you know is pleasing to God. And so the story opens with Zechariah. Is he bitter with God? Has he bailed on God? Has he bailed on his duties of being a priest? No. He shows up at the temple to do his duty. He shows up because so much about life with God is about faith and the persistence to keep showing up and doing the things that we're called to do while we're waiting for God to do what only God can do. And Zechariah kept showing up. And one day, he said it before an angel. And the angel appeared and says, wow. This idea of silence at work reminds me of Beethoven. Did you know that Beethoven wrote some of his greatest works while he was completely deaf? Beethoven never heard with his own ears the music he wrote the last 15 years of his life. He lived in a world of silence, and yet he continued to show up and to write what his heart heard and what he heard in his mind. And what he brought brought inspiration and pleasure to millions upon millions of ears for the last 200 years because he persisted through the silence. What do you do while you're waiting? You keep showing up and you do what God's called you to do while you wait for him to do what only he can do. The question is, will you show up 
And will you keep doing what you're called to do right now while you're waiting for him to do what only he can do? But the second thing that it tells us is this, that even when our faith is lacking, it won't stop God from moving in our lives. Zechariah may have been given the silent treatment, treatment for his struggle to believe, but he was blessed nonetheless with the baby boy. There's no question. There are stories in Scripture where God is absolutely moved by faith. But let me tell you what, God is not held hostage by faith or by a lack of it. Sometimes in certain religions and cultures in America, sometimes people get the, the idea that God is on a leash to our level of faith and that things don't happen because we don't believe enough. There's people preaching that right now. And I tell you, it's wrong. They haven't read the whole Bible because there are times when you can believe all you want and have all the faith in the world. It's not a faith issue. Maybe it's a timing issue. But even in the case where there's a lack of faith, as in Zechariah's part, part, part here, that did not stop God from blessing him with a baby boy. What if we were to spend a few moments this week thinking about all the moments in our lives when our faith was lacking, but God's provision still showed up? Just think about that. That should give us a reason to give thanks. The third takeaway is this, and I'm going to leave you with this. And I think the story in the, in, in, with Zechariah and Elizabeth reminds us to not lose sight of the greatest gift in the midst of all the other gifts we're so desperately longing for. Zechariah knew without a doubt that John was a gift of God. He knew that. There was no other reason that they had him, and yet Zechariah knew his gift of a baby boy was something to do with lifting up the greatest gift, and that's the gift of Jesus. And that's why his star song starts with him prophesying about Jesus, not even talking about his own son. Because I tell you what, it's Christmas. It's not Zechariah-less. It's not... John must, it's not even Lemus. You know how much I love Christmas. It is Christ must. It's about Christ. And I would tell you as we enter into this series, do not miss the lights in the midst of all the lights. Do not miss the gift in the midst of all the other gifts. And do not miss the tree that is the cross in the midst of all the other trees that are there. You know, Christmas can be a magical time of year for everyone. But I think it's especially magical for our children. Parents in the room will say a hearty amen and probably identify to this story. Because in any child's life, the anticipation of Christmas can be as joyful as the day itself. Presents are under the tree. I know one of my sons loved to look at the presents under the tree. One year, Carrie even changed the names. Different names on different packages. So just to throw off. And it heightened the anticipation even more. We look at the packages for weeks. And, and we wait. And we're hoping for the night that we can open them. And it comes. It's an adrenaline-filled, joyous experience for children of all ages, right? But then the magical day comes. Everyone's having the best of time, and, and, and the paper is flying, and it's like confetti everywhere in the room. But then everything's over, and there's a calm. And then in an instant, it's like a switch. What happened? There's a meltdown right in the middle of Christmas morning. <laughs> the parents are baffled. They're looking and says, the kid got everything they wanted. Why is he melting down? So the parent takes him aside and says, what's going on? What's wrong? And through the tears and, 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 and the other stuff that comes out, they said, I don't know. I got everything I wanted. 
but I'm still not happy. You know, I think about the story, I think childhood's an awful time to go through a midlife crisis. <laughs> but this can be the first taste of getting everything that we want, and yet it's still not being enough. When for the first time we awaken to something that has, as we adults even forget from time to time, that all of the gifts we so desperately won't, won't meet the need of the soul. Only the greatest gift will do that. And just maybe, as we parents witness our child's heart through things like this, perhaps crying out for the greatest gift of all, maybe, just maybe, we are God's children can be for just a moment and see the heart of a gracious and loving and merciful and giving Father. And maybe, just maybe, we can witness our child's heart looking for the greatest gift. And maybe that's something that even our adult hearts can do. We can be so full of disillusionment, full of angst and despair, and even fear. Because we're living in a world that points us to all these other gifts we so desperately want. While we neglect the ultimate gift that we so desperately need. The gift that meets the souls of our heart. I'm going to ask those that are serving communion this morning to go to their places. I want to give you a few moments to ponder some questions as we take communion today. I put three questions to ask, what's the Lord been saying to you? Maybe in your time of reflecting on Luke 1 this past week, or, or maybe in this moment, in this time, right now. I put three questions on the screen. What are you waiting on God for right now? And what does it mean for you to show up and be faithful in the meantime. Maybe another question for you, uh, you connect more with the second question. Can you think of a time when God moved in the midst of your lack of faith? Or maybe the third question is something that is more with you today. Will you join Zechariah and declare the gift of Jesus above all this month? I would say to every person that's watching and online and here, have you received Jesus? Because you can celebrate Jesus being born 10,000 times in Bethlehem, but until he is born in your heart, it will not make a qualitative difference in your life. We can help you make those steps and those decisions right after this service is over. But there's one thing to ponder in these questions with me. And I would ask you to pray with me. Lord, I thank you for your presence right now. I thank you for the work of your spirit to prompt Luke to record the stories. For we see ourselves in the stories. Father, I pray for my friends who are in a period of silence and waiting that you will empower them to continue to keep showing up and to do what you've called them to do all the while, while they wait to do and to see what only you can do. Father, I pray for others that are with us in this room and listening to me right now. Lord, I pray, pray that, that a prayer of thanksgiving for the times that your provision has come through, even in the midst of the times when our faith is struggling. Father, I pray still for others in this room who are looking to recover their focus upon the gift, the ultimate gift amongst all of the other gifts that they may want. We love you, Father. Jesus, we love you and we thank you. We thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. We thank you for the experience of salvation. We, the, the path of peace, the opportunity for new beginnings, for fresh starts. Father, we thank you for second chances. And we love you. 
for not giving up on us. And as we eat and drink this meal today, Father, we ask your blessings on it and us. In the name of Jesus, we pray amen.